This is Kentucky Afield Radio. This is Ron Rohde, Kentucky Afield's first host back in 1953. Now, I'm proud to present Charlie Baglin. Communication is a wonderful thing, and it works when both sides try. That's good advice for relationships, business partners. It's important when ordering pizza. Communication even applies in the wildlife world. Just like you and me, animals have wisdom. They have ears. They make sounds for very good reasons. We go inside outdoors and the social interactions in the hills and in the tree outside your window. Sort of gives tweeting a new meaning. Next on Kentucky Field Radio. Who's ready for a boatload of laughs? Give it up for Funny Sunny! Thanks. I found it. A use for a life jacket. A pillow! (laughs) Hey, I'm not going to wear a life jacket. I know how to swim. (laughs) How can it hurt you? It's just water. (laughs) This chick's hysterical. Funny Sunny, everyone. She'll be here all week. Maybe. Kentucky Conservation Officers remind you, your life jacket's got your back. April 30th is a day you should circle on your calendar, but so is today. Sportsmen and women, you need to get your name in the hat for fabulous Kentucky elk hunting. April 30th is the absolute last day to enter. So while you're thinking about it, and you know you want to, register today. The Kentucky Fish and Wildlife website is the one and only place to register, and it's as close as your PC. 900 names will be drawn. Yours could be one. Kentucky Elk Hunting. Register at fw.ky.gov. Welcome to Kentucky Afield. This is Charlie Baglin. Do you talk to yourself? Do you talk to your car? Do you yell at the TV? We spend an inordinate amount of time talking when nothing's listening. We're quick to talk to golf balls, baseballs. Maybe we have psychic power. We can will the results we desire. How else can you explain it? We talk to traffic a great deal. Traffic lights are a good one to get a piece of our mind. We feel like we have something to say, and by darn, we're going to be hurt. It doesn't matter if what we're talking to has ears or not. We communicate with words. We use facial expressions. Body language enters into what we have to say. We roll our eyes. We sneer. Have you ever been to a ball game and seen a guy in the stands go through the motions as if he is officiating the game? Just as if the officials on the field were going to look to him to confirm. So why do we do these things? We want control. We want a voice. We, as human beings, are a social creature. We are a conversant creature. And we simply can't help ourselves. It's our nature. Do you talk to your pets? Do they talk back? Yeah, sometimes they do. Expressions and tone of voice sometimes play more of a role than the words themselves. You speak English. The dog doesn't. But it responds to a snap, a whistle. But it knows all along that that's not how it communicates with other dogs. They speak their own language. But to people, the animals should understand us. Despite the fact we're speaking English or yelling in English, go, baby, go, every time we watch a horse race on TV. What is it, though, that animals understand? And what is it that people don't? Later this hour, we will talk to a professor at the University of Kentucky who teaches this subject. So we talk and we talk, hey, horsey, hey, doggy, hey, kitty, hey, red bird, and we might as well be talking to the moon except for one group of people, sportsmen and women. They can and do and are successful at talking and communicating with wild animals. Wildlife biologist Joe Lacefield is now in his third decade working as a wildlife biologist and a translator of sorts, a hunter, a songbird expert, Joe, we hear birds tweeting in the morning and evenings. What's being said? Well, usually, in a case of birds, it's the males singing, here I am, and the one that has the most attractive voice is going to attract the mate. Other things that they're saying is, here I am, you guys better stay away. They're protecting their territory. Exactly. So there's not a lot of chit-chat, I don't guess. Well, there are. There, there's 
warning notes and chip notes and you know if there's a snake climbing up a, a tree birds will make a different sound uh, an alarm sound that notify let the other birds know hey you know watch out same thing if you know, a hawk flies in and lands on a branch birds will make a different sound you can if you're aware in the woods while you're deer hunting or turkey hunting you can hear different birds doing different things and it'll let you know that something's coming if you're sending a warning sound, is that warning sound going to all birds or just those of the same species, you think? I think it's somewhat universal in that if, you know, a blue jay is raising cane, you know, there's a person, uh, there's a bobcat or a bear, there's something, a coyote, some predator, something that's a threat moving through the woods. I'm wondering how sophisticated it can get, though. There was a song, I guess this was in the 50s, Bobby Darren, If We Could Talk to the Animals squawk with the animals they could talk to us dr doolittle what kind of pets do you have well i have a i have a couple couple dogs i also my daughter has a cat which i feed so in in a sense it's my cat so do you talk to the cat and cat or do you talk to the cat in uh, english i say here kitty kitty and yeah. you know and it responds to that because it usually means there's food in the bowl you speak english the cat speaks cat that presumes if you're in the wilderness you're doing um an elk call that assumes that all elk speak the same language even though they didn't grow up together they may be a thousand miles apart do you anticipate that yes that's true that even though they didn't grow up like you and i did and there's different languages everywhere you turn it's not that way in the animal kingdom correct that's interesting if we could have grown up you in spain and me in wherever and we come together and we speak the same language that just doesn't happen, though, with humans, does it? I, I guess if you were looking at it, though, on a, a sonograph yeah. that, that basically shows the uniqueness of our voices, uh, even though we're speaking different languages, those sonographs would be very similar. I could see that. When you talk to your dogs, I bet a million times you've said, good dog, good dog, or sure. sure. You always speak in English. You don't speak in dog. Right. Do you think, could you speak in dog? Well, I, I think I could growl at a dog when he was getting close to my gravy and biscuits, and he'd know, oh, my dad's mad. <laughs> but let's say you go to hunt, and you want to hunt waterfowl or a duck or elk or turkey. Guess what you do then, Joe? You speak their language. You actually try to communicate ideas to the species, just as if you were speaking a second language. Now, people say, how many languages do you speak? How many languages do you speak, Joe? Well, as when it comes to wildlife languages, I guess I speak five or six at least. Yeah, so you, you don't always count that. Right. Because you speak English, and then you would leave it at that. But you don't forget you speak elk, deer. How many do you speak? Name them off. Elk, deer, turkey, coyote. I think that's just as valid. Yeah. So speaking, we we'll call it a foreign language, but a, a language other than... English. I can even do barred owls. There you go. What are you saying when you do that? I'm a barred owl. This is my tree. Talk to me in, in a language of, let's say, Turkey. Okay. She's either saying, I'm lost, I'm looking for another turkey, or I'm a hen hoping the gobbler is around. So this is heard mostly in breeding season. Mostly, but they'll also do that when they're flocking up in the fall. You know, it's usually a longer, more drawn-out series of, of yelps. And within a yelp, there's an excited yelp or cackle, which a hen will do many times when she's flying up into a tree at night or out of a tree in the morning. Or if uh, she sees another hen and doesn't recognize that hen, she may give a cackle and a cut. That's I'm lost. That really does sound like the real bird. When you're turkey hunting, you're reversing nature. The gobbler usually gobbles, and the hens go to him. You know, He's standing out there in an area that's open somewhat where he can display his feathers and show off his iridescence and uh, gobble, and the hen comes to him. Us calling a gobbler to us where we can get a, a shot at it or a chance to photograph it is, in a sense, reversing nature. 
vocabulary of wild animals. For turkey, I'm going to guess there may be ten words. Yeah, I'd say there's at least that many. You know, there's purrs, there's whines, there's kikis. So there's more than just different words. There are different voice characteristics. Yes. The absolute sweetest note that you can make is a purr. She'll just do a little soft. Joe Lacefield, wildlife biologist and game calling expert, is my guest. A break, and then we will have more. You're listening to Kentucky Field Radio. Writer Robert Brault made a comment once upon a time. The difference between friends and animals is that friends we allow into our company. Pets, songbirds, other wildlife, we allow into our solitude. We're back on Kentucky Field Radio talking about talking to things, but in their language, not ours. Wildlife biologist and game-calling expert Joe Lacefield is in the studio with me. Do you ever go out into the woods and just sit there and talk to the animals? Just as if that song were real. I do, with a camera sometimes. I don't do it usually if if I don't have a camera. Some really fond memories as a kid, and even to this day, if I'm out in the field and I hear a Bob White quail, I know he's looking for a hen and announcing his presence, and I can do a little... And usually he'll whistle back and come closer and closer and closer. And before I know it, he'll he'll be right in my lap. I've done that many times with, with landowners on TG visits in the field. And it, it always impresses them when you can do TG, that. that's technical guidance? Correct, technical okay. guidance. It's sort of like walking down the street for anybody else. And they see a dog and they say, hey, dog, nice dog. Are you a good dog? And they'll just start talking in English. But you can go into the woods and you can actually sort of that same basic exchange of ideas just with your voice speaking their language. Do various species have have about the same size vocabulary? Well, you know, there's some birds that are really unique that, that are mimics. You know, the brown thrashers and mockingbird. You know, mockingbird will repeat the same general note almost five times, you know, in, in a series, and it, it, it'll switch to a different note five times, and it'll be a big, long string of different sounds, but it keeps repeating those notes five times. A brown thrasher will do it three times. And a catbird does one note in a big, long series of, of different things. Like it'll throw 20 or 30 different notes out there in a, in a long series of, of different birds that you can identify. And then, com- and then it'll throw in one, which, oh, that's a catbird. <laughs> there is complexity to this that I never knew to appreciate. There really is. When I go out into the woods, I hear birds tweeting and singing. I just hear the basic blah, 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 you know, like they would write in a cartoon. But there's actually things being communicated. There is. And when I went to songbird training to learn the breeding birds of Kentucky to be able to do uh, point counts to survey our, our songbirds, it opened up a new world to me. Any day I'm out in the woods, I can hear different birds and be able to identify them. And... Even a a slow day hunting is always an exciting day because you're aware of all the different things that are going around and and the different birds that you're hearing. It's it's really neat. Now, I had the pleasure of turkey hunting with a a wounded veteran. He had lost his eyesight and his legs in an IED explosion. And to sit in a turkey blind with him, trying to call in a turkey for him, and the whole time pointing out the different birds and and different sounds that, that he was hearing. And it was really, uh, really neat to share that with, with him. So out of the 360 birds that wander in and out of the state, there may be 100 or so. And my numbers aren't specific, but songbirds that you can go out, especially in the spring, and hear them singing to one another. And point counts, that means you have to be able to identify what you're hearing at a single place in the woods. Correct. Usually by mid-May, most of the migrating warblers are already through that's when it's really confusing is april and early may when you have so many of the, of the migrating warblers that you typically you know don't hear and, you, and they're flying in flocks and several different species within a flock all 
warbling at the same time. It is kind of blah, blah, blah. But you have to train yourself to pick out a, a particular sound. And that's the thing about doing a point count. You're writing down a compass direction, that bird you heard that far away, and then you ignore that bird and go to the next one. You're, you're there three to five minutes writing down those birds on a piece of paper. And being able to tune out the things that you don't want to hear is probably the most difficult part of it, not identifying the birds, but ignoring the ones that you've already picked out. Hear a voice in a crowd. That can't be easy. My wife doesn't understand how I can hear a turkey gobble 300 yards away and not hear her six feet away. I can't. How is that? <laughs> I don't know. Teach me that trick. <laughs> I, yeah, I, I sometimes feel turkeys when they gobble. It's it's not a matter of, of hearing them. It's just like, oh, yeah, he just shook the ground. I felt that. <laughs> what other calls do you have in front of you there, Joe? Well, I have, let's talk about elk a little bit. You know, we have the largest herd east of the Mississippi, and a cow elk sounds remarkably like a bird. And it's hard to believe that a five, 600-pound animal sounds like this. cow communicating, here I am, I'd like some company. And then if a bull were in the area, he would respond. (laughs) And what are you saying when you say that to an elk? I'm saying I'm a bull and I would like a cow and I'd like to run any bulls around that are here away. Sometimes it's not just a call or a conversation. You mean you have to you have to yell it. And I'm thinking about ducks when they're way up in the sky and geese. Right. And you have to do these calls so loud to get their attention. What are you saying when you make a duck call? Well, you're saying, "Hey, got food and water right here. Come on down." <laughs> or sound like a drake. <laughs> So these look sort of like whistles. You're blowing into these. Some you've made with your mouth. Some you've made with your hands on a on a slate. Per call with turkey, for example, right. blowing through to. It's amazing what we utilize to help us speak to animals. Or you consider Max Headroom, Siri, computers that talk back to us. Some more convincing than others. We don't hear the subtleties. I think a turkey would or a duck would. Exactly. You know, it's usually more. Cadence. I wonder if that if there are any hens out there that have lisps, <laughs> or they just stutter, or they stammer. There's there's turkeys that sound different. They none of them sound exactly alike. Is there a way beyond just having an ear for it that you can look at it on a spectrograph or a, in waveform digitally and say, yeah, there is absolutely no difference between this real duck and this duck call. Yeah, you you can compare them on a a sonograph or spectrograph or whatever, I mean, and see the, the peaks and valleys. From a goose standpoint, you know, geese make many sounds. They grunt, they chuckle, they cluck and honk. I'm convinced there is a goose in this room. I'm glad it sounded like a goose. I cannot tell the difference. Do you think a goose can, or is it just because of the distance... There's wind in their face, the whole bit. It's close enough. When you have 100 decoys out and you have four or five guys that are each doing a little bit of... It sounds like a flock of geese that are on the ground. It does. It does. And one person calling geese is very difficult. It's easy to say, yeah, that's not right. Because if those geese were on the ground, it would be more than that one goose talking. So having several guys that are blowing calls is going to increase the odds of birds working the spread and coming in. It helps camouflage the bad notes and make it all sound, sounds like real geese. You know, many people that waterfowl hunt also have dog whistles. And and the drake call that I showed you there makes a sound. You can also do that with a dog whistle. And that's basically the whistle a referee would use. Yes. You, before you came here, said, I take this seriously. I don't go out into the woods and just sit there and make a noise. 
you actually want to have an exchange with these animals. Right. You want to interact. In this case, do you know what you're saying? I think I know what I'm saying. Is there, you can know, you translate it? You know, you know, in my opinion, you know, the scenario that I just played for you, you know, I gave a hand sound. It could be, I am here. I am here. That's basically what I was saying is, I am here. And by him going into strut, he's saying, I am here. You know, in that particular situation that I just described to you, I, I threw two things. You know, I, I tried the Jake Yelp. One, thinking it would call that Jake that was with that gobbler, or that I thought was with that gobbler, in. And two, maybe make that gobbler jealous that here's a Jake with this receptive hen. If I make him jealous, maybe he'll come in. Yeah. Whether that's what worked or whether it's just the fact that I called the Jake, because the Jake that was with him did show up first. Well, just the concept of jealousy right, is something we wouldn't really think about, is one bird is jealous of another, but it actually is true. Exactly, and that works with elk as well. For someone who wanted to learn this, where do they start? Well, there's lots of stuff on YouTube. I mean, there's a tremendous amount of information that's out there now that wasn't out there when I started. Joe, it's been interesting. I appreciate you coming in and bringing all the voices you do for Wild Game with you. Glad to do it. Communication is a wonderful thing, and it works when both sides try. Just ahead, wouldn't you like to know what wildlife knows, whatever that may be? It's a college class, you know. We'll take a look at the course outline and have a fishing report just ahead on Kentucky Field Radio. If you would like to hear this show again or email it to a friend, share it on Facebook, first place I would send you is Facebook. Just put Kentucky Afield Radio in the search box, and there we are. Go to iTunes. We're a podcast every week, and plus you can find us on YouTube. A lesson on animal psychology next after the fishing report. Hi, this is John Williams with the fishing report for Southeast Kentucky at Lake Cumberland. Our Creel Clerks report that fishing has been really heating up in recent weeks, especially crappie has been very good. Uh, crappie are up in the creeks uh, being caught on jigs or jig and minnow combinations around flooded sycamore trees or down trees. Seeing some nice crappie, 10 to even up to 15 inches or so, and mostly black. Also in Lake Cumberland, stropper fishing has been good. At least some of the fish have moved out to the main lake, being caught on soft plastic swim baits or casting doll flies and grubs, and some of those fish are over 30 inches. Uh, elsewhere in the tailwater at Lake Cumberland, I've seen some very nice trout come out of there. It's always a good spot if you like trout fishing. They can be caught on spinners or spoons or small cranks. Trout are being stocked in Rock Creek. The seasonal catch and release ended at the end of March, so those trout are available for harvest. As always, good luck and good fishing. This is Tom with your fishing report from the Northeast. With temps running in the middle to upper 50s, the big three at Cave Run are all doing well. Largemouth bass are up in shallow, being caught on creature baits and jigs in the riverine portion of the lake, so that's going to put you in the Poppin' Rock and Banger areas. Crappie are being caught in the same areas, just a little bit deeper, around 10 to 15 feet. And for both, you're going to be focusing on structure. Muskie are still cranking on the main lake. You're going to be fishing the back ends of the main coves. Good reports coming out of Grayson as well. Crappie are in about four to six feet of water and being caught on tube jigs and minnows. Sunfish are coming off the bluff walls with red worms. And largemouth are in about five to eight feet of water with crankbaits and spinnerbaits. For access points on Kinney Connect and many of our other streams, check out fw.ky.gov and search for fishing and boating access at the top of the page. That should do it for us. Wherever you go, good luck and stay safe. This is Rob Rowland in the Northwestern Fishery District. Nolan River Lake is 11 feet below Summer Pool, and it's on a slow rise up to Summer Pool. Rough River Lake is 5 feet below Summer Pool, and right now it's holding fairly steady while they do some work on the dam. Crappie fishing has been hot at both reservoirs on a variety of jigs and minnows. Any place you can basically find some submerged brush just a few feet deep. No land, they're even catching them up the headwater rivers up to around the Broad Ford area. White bass at No Land has been outstanding. Bass fishing also good at both reservoirs. No Land anglers have been catching several walleye. Lake Malone anglers are catching some nice bass there as well. So that's a report from the Northwestern District Fishery Lakes. Lots of opportunities out there, so we'll get out there and enjoy our waters and fishing. April 30th is a day you should circle on your calendar, but so is today. Sportsmen and women, you need to get your name in the hat for fabulous Kentucky elk hunting. 
April 30th is the absolute last day to enter. So while you're thinking about it, and you know you want to, register today. The Kentucky Fish and Wildlife website is the one and only place to register, and it's as close as your PC. 900 names will be drawn. Yours could be one. Kentucky Elk Hunting. Register at fw.ky.gov. We're back into our second half hour on Kentucky Field Radio. My name is Charlie Baglin, and back in 1992 or so, the Kentucky Department of Fish and Wildlife was restoring river otters to the state of Kentucky. The critters were brought to Kentucky from Louisiana, where they thrive. They live down there in the bayou. And I remember it. There was a slew of these things, maybe two or three dozen. They were all in cages and awaiting release. A fellow that I work with, director of the Division of Wildlife at the time for the Department of Fish and Wildlife, was named Lauren Schaefe. And he and I were standing there side by side, and he looked down at me and he said, Bagman, wouldn't you like to know what they know, whatever that may be? I've never looked at an otter or a wild animal the same way since. Sure, they know how to forage. They know how to find shelter and seek mates. But what else? How do you account for knowledge of instinct? Is there an IQ test for rabbits, deer? At the University of Kentucky College of Arts and Sciences, this is a class that is taught by my guest this half hour, Dr. Thomas Zentall. And, Dr. Welcome, we say wise old owl, but how do we really know that? (laughs) The name I give this area is typically given is comparative cognition. So it's the cognitive ability of across species, including our own. So we're making comparisons and asking to what degree animals share abilities that we have and deficits, if you will, what I call suboptimal behavior. When we aren't behaving rationally, do animals also behave irrationally? And that's called comparative cognition. It's an area that falls between psychology and biology, There are behavioral ecologists who study animals in nature. They are not sure why we do the work that we're doing because they feel we're treating animals in an unnatural way, which is true. And my argument is always that we humans live in a very artificial environment as well. We have to learn all kinds of skills that we didn't evolve to learn, and yet we're pretty good at doing it. And it turns out animals are pretty good at doing it too. Not as good as we are, but pretty good. They don't evolve as quickly as we can build the city where once was their home. I understand, and and that's a fascinating question. It has to do with culture, really. Take our intelligence, and there's some question about why we, how, how we develop this intelligence, but some different theories. One of them is that we're, because we figured out how to balance ourselves on two legs, That allowed us to have a much larger brain because we could balance our brain on our necks and shoulders, whereas most animals have to hang their head out in midair and hold their head horizontally, and that limits how large their brain can be. And so our brain could grow much larger because we don't have that stress on the neck. So what I know about animals occurs in humans, but humans have so much more than that. There's more. Most animals that engage in what we would call play behavior actually involves honing skills for later life. So animals that engage in rough and tumble play, like cats and dogs, are predators. Animals that are prey animals don't generally engage in that kind of behavior. We do this with animals. As you say, we talk to our animals as if they understand us. And, and we, in a sense, treat them, many times we treat them as family members. That's another issue, too, why we have animals around at all and why we treat them as if they are human-like. We get annoyed with them when they do things that we don't approve of, and we praise them for good things and that sort of thing. But is it easier for people to accept other things if we see them as more like us? Yeah, I think so. There's another aspect of this, which is... When you talk about anthropomorphizing, we do this even with objects that don't look anything like living things. Such as a a storm cloud, maybe. A storm cloud. I was thinking of a car. Yeah, a car. Try to start our car in the morning. We we might refer to it as she, and we might say, my car didn't want to start this morning. It 
gives it intentionality. It didn't want to start. We wouldn't do that with a light switch, with something that's very predictable, that's very unlikely to misfire, to fail. But when it's a machine, then we tend to give it a kind of a human quality of being unpredictable. You deal a lot with, from the research I've read about you, Doctor, is that you, you use pigeons and you work a lot with dogs. Can we actually communicate with animals? Is it possible? We'll sit there and we'll have conversations with uh, the dog. What do you think I should have for dinner tonight when we know the dog's not going to answer? Do you think there is some level of communication back and forth between you and the creature? Well, certainly, especially a dog. I mean, there are lots of, they can understand certain words. Um, I had a dog, and if I said, do you want to go out, the dog would just jump up and wag its tail and jump around and go to the door, and it knew exactly what I was saying. But if you went up to a stranger's dog and said, do you want to go out, it wouldn't respond that no. way at all. No. All right, let's take a group of people who, for example, hunters who will go duck hunting or turkey hunting it would be a good one. Well, they'll sit there and they'll make their, their purr calls, their turkey calls, and try to entice that creature to come forward Well, they'll get a better shot, shake sure. dinner home. In your book, that certainly would have to suffice as communication. Yes, but that would be using the animal's natural form of communication that says, I'm another turkey, come close. And that's deception on our part, but the turkey is natural behavior. So it's, yeah, turkeys, I mean, most animals can communicate with each other. They have lots of communication signals. Dogs, when they encounter each other for the first time, have a number of signals that they give. If a dog puts its ears back and bares its teeth, the other dog knows that this dog is not happy. So, yeah, there are cross-species signals, especially between a predator and prey that indicate something about the intentions of both animals. I knew a fellow once, he would go fishing. Just as if he were calling a dog and the dog could understand, he would say, here, fishy, fishy, here, fishy, fishy. Now, I know, and he knows, that fish can't hear him, and if he did, he wouldn't understand. Exactly. But yet we love sure. to have this conversation as make-believe as it is, with all of these animals. It is just really fascinating. Are all cultures like this? I think some other cultures tend to draw sharper lines between themselves and other species. So I think originally, I think when dogs first interacted with humans, it wasn't quite the same way we do now, where we have pets that we treat at almost as humans, members of the family. So that's different. But I think in other cultures, they've often had spirits and gods that were animal-like. I mean, the, the Native Americans have um, all kinds of animals, eagles and coyotes that play a role in their lore. They have certain characteristics that are very human-like. We like things that are more like us. Now, my area of research is, is animals and the, the way they are like and dislike us. I'm very much interested in their cognitive ability, and more recently I've been interested in how they make the same kinds of mistakes that we do. Uh, more interested in some sort of technical kinds of abilities. One of the things about humans that's really remarkable that's not given enough credit is the degree to which we imitate, that we learn from watching, the degree to which other animals can learn concepts that we use. So one of the things is I know that if, if the ball rolls under a couch, a dog will understand, even though the ball is not visible anymore, that it's there mm -hmm. and will try to get to it. That makes sense. Double and you can get more complicated, like a shell game, you know, where you have three shells and you put a pea under one of them and move them around. Right. That's really complicated. But you can do some simple experiments with dogs, for example, in where you put a treat into a container and then you've got a couple of containers and you move them around. Will they go to the right container? And they will. So they will understand 
even though they didn't see the treat move, they saw the container that it was in move, and that's something we call object permanence. It's the fact that objects have permanence even if you can't see them. So they can associate A with B, and, and they'll get it right. They get it right 100% of the time? Pretty much. Is yeah. that due to them actually following the, the, the bouncing ball, or is that because they can smell it? It's because they're following. That's a really good question. You should have been a psychologist because you have to have the right controls. And so if they can't see the container moved, they're a chance. But if they see it move, then they go directly to the one that's the correct one. So I was interested in whether they can learn to imitate. And it turns out dogs can imitate, but more surprisingly, pigeons can too. And I would not have guessed that because they're generally thought not to be so intelligent, but they're, they're good at that. What animals do you work with beyond pigeons dogs. and dogs? I work with rats, and I've done some work with Japanese quail. They imprint usually on the mother, and so I've looked at uh, imitation in Japanese quail, and they're very good imitators. I don't know how you measure the IQ of an animal. You hear people say, the wild turkey is a wary animal, is very smart, or my dog is very smart, and then they'll reference another animal that said doesn't have a sense, God gave a goose. Are yep. there smart animals? Are there not so smart animals? Well, there probably are, but I'm not sure that we use the right dimensions to judge them. That is, we judge them by our own abilities. So the fact that a pigeon can find its way from Columbus, Ohio, to Lexington, Kentucky, I think is unbelievable because we're not able to do that very well without reading signs, and they know how to get there. But uh, And they do use things like landmarks, but they also use where the sun is in the sky, and they use magnetic fields to some extent. They have a compass in their heads, and so they use a, a variety of devices like that. They learn relatively slowly. If you ask them in the right way, they can usually give you what I would think of as a, a smart answer. But one of the things I've been doing recently is looking at gambling behavior, which we are very susceptible to, even though we know full well that the, the return on our investment is usually very poor. You can say that again. We will pick up there, UK professor Dr. Tom Zental, specialist in animal behavior. We'll back with more. This is Kentucky Field Radio. Have you ever considered what animals must think of us? I mean, you come in from the grocery store with the most amazing haul of chicken and pork and steaks. They must think we are the most amazing hunters on earth. We're back with our final few minutes on Kentucky Field Radio. My name is Charlie Baglin. My guest is Dr. Tom Zental, Doctor of Psychology at the University of Kentucky. He specializes in the better understanding of animals, what they're thinking. What do they know? How complex is it, really? When we left off, you had brought up the idea that animals are known to roll the dice. One of the things I've been doing recently is looking at gambling behavior, which we are very susceptible to, even though we know full well that the return on our, our, our investment is usually very poor. But we do it anyway. It's fun. What does it mean that it's fun? Would an animal do the same thing? Now, when I talk to biologists, they say absolutely not, because getting food is really important to them. And so if you say you want to buy a lottery ticket to a pigeon, it should say no, because the likelihood of winning is so small, <laughs> I would die before I win, before I get my food. And so it wouldn't buy a lottery ticket. Well, it turns out that it is attracted the same way we are to gambles. I find that really interesting because it suggests that humans are not just doing it for the what we would call the fun of it. It's brain stimulation. There's something that stimulates the reward centers in our brain when we think about, anticipate the possibility of a reward. We are in different places along the hierarchy of needs. We may need to take a chance because all of our other needs have been met. We have a place to live. We have food, career. We have income. Now, a bird, all he wants is something to eat. That's right. Uh, so I don't... We're very different, right? But we're not. And in fact, here's the interesting thing. If you look at people who gamble, it tends to be negatively correlated 
with socioeconomic level by and large, certainly proportionately, people who can't afford it will gamble more than people who can't afford it. That doesn't make any sense, but it's true of pigeons too, by the way. The hungrier the pigeon is, the more likely it is to gamble. What way does he gamble? So we have to give it a choice between gambling and not gambling. If it chooses not to gamble, it pecks, let's say, a light on the right, and it gets fed three pellets. But if it pecks a light on the left, there's a 20% chance that it'll get 10 pellets hmm. and an 80% chance it'll get nothing. On average, when they gamble, they get two pellets because 20% of 10 is two. And if they choose the sure thing, they get three pellets. If they are really hungry, they always go for the gamble, the 10 pellets. If they're not so hungry, they'll go for the three pellets. Now figure that out. So they'll roll the dice to get two pellets where they could get eight or 10, right? You will time their meals so that you know just how hungry they would be going into the experiment. Right. Are right. there other animals that behave similarly? Yeah, rats will too. So it, it tends to be fairly general and it tends to be correlated. The other thing that we've done, which, which we think has some interesting implications for humans, is the idea of what if we give them other activities. So we have one room that's filled with, it has a couple of big cages in it where they can kind of fly around a little bit and we, they can interact with their other pigeons. Normally, they're in individual cages, and they're in a room where they can see each other, but they can't interact, and they can't do very much. If they are in these what we call flight cages, we just put them in there a few hours a day, then they tend to gamble less. They tend to take fewer risks. So we think that their motivation to gamble may be driven by what we would call boredom, the lack of activity. And that may be true of humans as well, because... If you're doing it for fun, then you're not finding other things that you find as fun to do. So that has some implications for how to go about treating compulsive gamblers, maybe get them involved in other activities. Once upon a time, and I was watching Star Trek, and this goes back, but they said that there was no relationship between intelligence and the size of one's brain. Do you remember that episode? I don't, but I know that I know that bird brains is not a very good description of my pigeons. But that's another issue, and and uh, birds tend to have very closely packed neurons, much more closely packed than ours, and so they can do it with a much smaller brain per per unit size. So it's not nice at all. It's actually a compliment. If That's you call right. someone a bird brain. That's right. They have a very efficient brain. And actually their brain sometimes um, can grow smaller parts of their brain that they don't use, like the signaling you talked about in the spring. That's right. a part of their brain called the hippocampus that shrinks in the winter. So when they fly around, they don't have to have as much to hold up in the air. Anyway, the the idea of the... The um, walking on two legs and having this large brain allowed us, the, the theory goes that it allowed us these complex social interactions. We're really good at interacting with people, at forming alliances, at keeping track of who has been nice to us and who has not. We have amazing individual recognition, and all this requires great brain power. But then I think what's happened is we've learned how to use this brain, brain power in new ways, ways that evolution didn't really so-called intend, didn't really select for. We just figured out with this big brain how to make tools, how to speak language, complex language, how to build airplanes and cities and all those things. And we do it by this process sometimes called ratcheting where we pass on knowledge from one generation to another and that is allowed for an explosion in knowledge and animals have very little of that for example chimpanzees will take a rock and put a hard nut on it and take another rock and smash the nut open to get what's inside they have learned how to use tools that's right and they pass it on and most animals have 
either little or none of that ability, and we have managed to really capitalize on that in an amazing way. It's a fascinating subject, Doctor. It's discussions like this that really give us a deeper appreciation for the wild world around us. I appreciate your questions. Absolutely. Thank you so much for calling, Charlie. All right. It's been a pleasure talking to you. Have a good day. Thanks. Bye. Bye. Google Thomas Zental. That's Z-E-N-T-A-L-L, and you can find out much, much more. We are out of time. This is Charlie Baglin inviting you to join us in a week, and we will go inside outdoors again here on Kentucky Field Radio.